So these six topics are going to be on uh, airway surgery, on uh, POCD, uh, non-invasive ventilation, uh, post-herpetic neuralgia, coagulation, and on spinal needles. So the first question is on airway surgeries, and uh, the question has two parts. Uh, first part is, what are the general considerations in case of anesthesia for airway surgery? So this carries around 40% of the mass. And what are the various ventilatory strategies for airway surgery? This has 60% uh, uh, of the mass. Now in the new examination, um, this probably will be broken down into a lot more sections and you have to answer each section. So uh, they could actually give, uh, you know, divide the first part into another uh, two parts and the third part into another three or four parts. So when it comes to general consideration for airway surgery, we need to know what, about the lesion, uh, where the lesion is, what size is it, how far it is extending, and uh, is it mobile or is it stuck? Is it affecting the laryngeal function? Is the voice affected? And is it affecting the airway patency? We also need to know if there has been any previous anesthetic. There might have been anesthesia for say biopsies. And if the patient had uh, anesthesia or any surgical procedure, what were the findings? Uh, sometimes the tumors can grow pretty rapidly or the patient might have been subjected to radiotherapy, which can then shrink the size of the tumor. It can uh, reduce its uh, size, appearance can change and uh, mobility can change as well. It would be nice to actually have a look at the uh, CT or MRI images uh, to especially the cross-sectional images to see um, about or the upper and lower limits of the lesion or how it is affecting the airway. Uh, the ENT surgeon normally perform a nasal endoscopy, so it's a good idea to go through the, um, your uh, notes, surgeon's notes, and see uh, if they have actually put down anything warning uh, on the, you know, the notes, uh, whether uh, they were able to visualize the vocal cords easily or it was obstructing the airway. So you'll have a lot of information from that. Coming to the, uh, uh, the category of patients, uh, there are normally two categories of patients. So you could actually have uh, elderly patients uh, who might present uh, with a air lesion. And these patients normally have coexisting respiratory and cardiovascular uh, morbidity. And this often is a result of long-term smoking and alcohol abuse. And because this is in the elderly patients and they may be malignant lesions, or they may also show side effects of uh, treatment uh, for the lesion. They might have been offered radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And because these are elderly patients with uh, comorbidities, uh, you might need to actually use invasive intraoperative monitoring and might have to modify your anesthesia technique because you want to uh, reduce the cardiorespiratory problems associated with these comorbidities. The other group is uh, fairly young children um, or children with learning disabilities who might have inhaled or ingested uh, foreign objects. So they present an emergency situation. There are a psychosocial uh, factors associated with any you know, airway surgery. Uh, the patients, whether it's young or old, uh, they can have fear of choking, uh, dying, uh, or if they have been told that they might need a tracheostomy, that inability to communicate. And uh, the elderly patients, if they have uh, a tumor, they might actually come back for uh, multiple procedures. So coming to the anesthesia, it's uh, obviously going to be a shared airway and uh, the idea is to optimize uh, uh, surgical access 
uh, where your undertaker tube will be there or there is, uh, you know, the airways are being shared uh, between the anesthetist and the surgeon. Also surgeon normally they cover uh, the eyes. And so you make sure that the eyes are well protected. They tend to extend the head quite a lot on a ring and with a shoulder pad. And the way they introduce the uh, uh, bronchoscope or uh, their uh, laryngoscopes is totally different and hence the teeth need to be protected as well. Okay. So that was the first part of the question. So what is the general concentration? Then coming to the ventilatory strategies, if there are smaller procedures or uh, even in the uh, adult patients, uh, sometimes the whole procedure can be done with just topical anesthesia on a bit of sedation with patient breathing spontaneously. So no instrumentation of the airway bias. It can be done uh, using um, spontaneous anesthesia with general anesthesia. Uh, this is normally done in pediatric patients. Uh, so we have the uh, ventilating bronchoscopes like a stores uh, bronchoscope to which you can attach uh, our breathing system. Or we can actually just intubate the patient uh, with a micro laryngeal tube. So this is size uh, six tube We're using uh, you know, standard anesthesia equipment. Uh, the problem obviously is there is reduced access to the surgical field because this is a large tube. And uh, the trachea tube you are going to use, even though it's a micro laryngeal tube, it can obscure the posterior one third of the glottis. And um, because you're ventilating the patient or you know, this can be, uh, the operative field can be relatively mobile. It's not much of a problem because we do tend to paralyze the patient. So I think the respiratory movement shouldn't be too, too much, shouldn't be too much of issues. So here you can actually see a bronchoscope, rigid bronchoscope to which uh, we have a normal anesthesia circuit is attached. And uh, you can also see the monitoring uh, for gas monitoring and tidal CO2 monitoring, though it's not very easy, but it can be done in these cases with a normal circuit. Uh, this is a rigid laryngoscope used by the ENT surgeons. And again, on the bottom end, you can actually see an attachment uh, with a tube. This is normally a tube uh, that is used for jet ventilation. So the other uh, strategy is to use uh, low frequency jet ventilation. And uh, this is uh, using a Sanders injector or jet ventilator. Uh, so here the high pressure gas source is uh, provided through a narrow cannula attached to a suspension laryngoscope or bronchoscope. And uh, it is hand operated by the anesthetist. Um, then you switch on and off for around, around breaths or 10 to 20 breaths per minute. So there is a stream of high velocity gas which entrains air. So there is dilution of the uh, oxygen you're going to give. And this entrainment of air uh, creates a tidal volume. Uh, even though it reduces the FiO2, it does produce tidal volume. So we do actually get a uh, operating field which is relatively mobile uh, for a short period of times. And uh, low frequency jet ventilation is easy to perform and the equipment is not too complicated at all and it does not obstruct the surgeon's view. So the surgeon get a good field. So here is this, um, your uh, you know, laryngoscope with a jet. So you can see uh, how, because of the jetting, it is, causes a, a Bernoulli effect and uh, the air is entrained and it dilutes the oxygen coming through the jet. Here you can actually see on the right side is the uh, anesthetist hand and uh, his thumb is actually on the switch. So this is the one he's going to press 10 to 20 times per minute. And uh, this is uh, attached to the oxygen source. You can see that um, again in the field. So this is a jet 
uh, ventilator, low frequency jet ventilator. There are disadvantages uh, with low frequency jet ventilators and nowadays they are actually not used much. There's a risk of barotrauma and it's important that the upper way remains patent throughout when using the jet ventilator. You cannot assess the adequacy of ventilation and you cannot monitor entitled CO2 in these cases. And neither can you deliver volatile anesthetics, so you will actually have to use total intravenous anesthesia. Because of the entrainment of air, uh, they can be flapping of the, uh, especially for the supraglottic device, uh, you know, uh, ventilation, and uh, this can be cause movement of the operative field is quite possible. And if the uh, suspension laryngoscope is not properly aligned with the airway, uh, there can be gastric insufflation can happen. So next uh, we come to high frequency jet ventilation. This is the machine and that's the bronchoscope. This. So high frequency jet ventilation is can be delivered via a supraglottic device like a, a suspension laryngoscope. It can be delivered subglottically using a, a long catheter. So I'll show, show some images or it can be done transtracheally through a cricothyroid uh, cannula. So it can be done in three different ways. And the onset and offset of inspiration is uh, controlled uh, by a high frequency flow interrupter, which can be pneumatic, pneumatically controlled or electronically controlled. So here too, there is actually air entrainment does occur. And uh, so tidal volume that is generated is usually uh, much less than conventional ventilation because, because of the, it depends on uh, whether you're, uh, you know, the, how you're delivering it. Uh, is it supraglottic, uh, subglottic or transtracheal? Entrainment of air actually differs in all these three different uh, modalities. On the ventilator, you can set the FIR2, you can set the driving pressure of the gas, uh, you can set the frequency between 60 to 600 breaths per minute. And you can also set the inspiratory time. So inspiratory time is usually 30% uh, of the cycle. So 70% is, is the expiration. Expiration is always uh, passive. So you need to let expiration happen. So in this diagram, you can actually see uh, that uh, the first one A is a supraglottic uh, jet ventilation. And the uh, second one is a subglottic jet catheter. And the third one is a transtracheal jet ventilation uh, through the cricothyroid uh, puncture. Uh, this is a uh, Bonnell's uh, high frequency jet ventilator. And uh, these are these subglottic catheters that can be used uh, with jet ventilation. So these are a few diagrams of how the gas entrainment occurs and how much it is. So if you actually have a supraglottic ventilation, then you can actually see there is significant amount uh, that is a gray, large gray and small gray uh, arrow. The dark uh, black arrow is the jet. So in the supraglottic, there is greater airway, um, air entrainment as compared to the subglottic ventilation. And if it is transtracheal, again, uh, the entrainment is much less. And in this case, it's important uh, that the uh, airway is kept patent. Uh, otherwise, there can be barotrauma with transtracheal jet ventilation. And there have been quite a few cases of uh, severe barotrauma uh, with jet ventilation when it was done through the transtracheal uh, approach uh, where the upper airway was obstructed. So it's important for the gases. There has to be a method of gases uh, being uh, expired out. Okay. So high frequency jet ventilation uh, does um, uh, give a immobile operative field, uh, especially when it's used at very high frequencies. And disadvantage, uh, like other jet ventilation, you cannot deliver volatile anesthetics. So you will actually have to use uh, TIVA and that means you need more equipment. You cannot monitor carbon dioxide. Okay. 
and airway is not protected. There's no cuffed endotracheal tubes used in these cases. The risk of barotrauma, like I said, remains. And the gases cannot be humidified. And so this is okay for short procedures. Uh, but with long procedures, it uh, not only causes drying, but it also causes uh, uh, cooling of the gases. Okay. So that was our first question. Uh, coming to the second question. The second question is on uh, the POCD. And uh, the first part of this is, uh, what are the components of mini mental state examination? MMSE, so this is only 20%. Uh, what is post-operative cognitive dysfunction? Uh, this is another 20%. Uh, list the predisposing factors for POCD and what are the causes for this condition? Uh, that is uh, 30%. And how will you modify your anesthetic technique to reduce the incidence of POCD? Uh, that is 30%. Now, this is a question that you need to prepare uh, well. You need to know the components, uh, whether you actually have a mnemonic for that, I do not know. Uh, but if you have, let me know. So the components of mini mental state examination are orientation in time and place, uh, reputation of name, object, and simple phrases, uh, ability to undertake simple arithmetic, uh, recall of object named earlier in the interview. Uh, naming of objects shown by the examiner. Uh, execution of simple tasks, simple design, simple sentences. So it's about uh, simple task by written and spoken command, uh, copying a simple design or writing a simple sentence. So here is an example of a uh, mini mental examination, uh, there can be little modifications to it. So you can actually see that uh, it has uh, got uh, questions about orientation. So which year it is, which season, which month, date and time, country you're living in, town you're living in, district, hospital, ward and floor. And you keep giving the marks over each other, over five. Then there is about registration, attention and calculation, recall, language, uh, copying simple, you know, drawing. And then you total the uh, scores. Okay, so um, this is, so that was about the MMSC, the components. So as long as you know the components of that, you just need to list them and uh, you can get 20% of the mask. Coming to the definition of post-operative cognitive dysfunction now, um, if you look in terms of research, uh, it is described as post-operative decline in cognition uh, compared with an individual's pre-operative measurement on various neuropsychological tests. So just like a uh, mini mental test, you do pre-op, you do post-op, and you do it again. Okay. And it does not require documentation of post-operative clinical symptoms or complaints or what cognitive impairment uh, noted by the patient, family members, or clinicians. Okay, so... Uh, when you look at uh, the way uh, post-operative cognitive deficit first come into picture, is when the relatives actually tell the clinician, he say my dad or my granddad or you know my wife doesn't look the same as she was pre-operative. That's when you start thinking of POCD. So if you look at the post-op cognitive deficit in general, is defined as long-term, possibly permanent disabling. Uh, disorder, uh, deterioration in the cognitive function following a surgery. And you, this is commonly uh, in layman's term seen as, you know, like I said, uh, you know, the relatives describe the condition of the patient as compared to their cognitive function before the surgery. The grandchildren will say, oh, granddad was never the same after his operation. He doesn't seem to remember or doesn't seem to recognize or doesn't seem to, you know, register what we're saying. So those kind of things uh, are used. So what are the risk factors? So we can look at the preoperative risk factors, intraoperative risk factors, and postoperative risk factors. So preoperative cognitive impairment, um, is one of the risk factors. So the patient already has some kind of an overt 
dementia. And uh, this is only possible if you actually go deeper into the history. And uh, this might come from the patient's relatives or it might looking at the drug history. So if somebody is actually on, you know, drugs like uh, donipazil or mimantin uh, for, a, for a period of time, then you actually have to start thinking, obviously there, this patient actually has seen a psychiatrist or been to the memory services. Then old age, uh, the incidence can be as much as four to 55%. And it is seen uh, in older patients who are scheduled for emergency surgery, for cardiac surgery, orthopedic hip or knee surgeries. It's quite common. The next risk factor is actually level of education. So higher the level of education, the lesser the chances of patient actually developing post-operative cognitive deficit. So it's more common in uh, low educational achievers than in high uh, achievers. Other risk factors can be like preoperative uh, sleep uh, disruptions. A uh, patient has not been sleeping well, excessive consumption of alcohol, use of psychotropic drugs. Uh, Comorbidities such as neural damage, example, stroke, traumatic brain injury, severe vascular disease, diabetes, or frailty can be a risk factor. Now, these are more of a risk factor for patient, uh, you know, developing uh, uh, post-op delirium. Uh, but then delirium and um, POCD is exactly one spectrum. Uh, so delirium is, is a lower end of spectrum, uh, whereas a POCD comes from the other end of spectrum. So they can be. But then delirium are usually treatable. Uh, they are treatable cause, okay? whereas uh, this continues to them. Coming to interoperative uh, risk factors, uh, one of the uh, major risk factor or is um, uh, major prolonged uh, or emergency procedures and uh, cardiac surgeries are more prone to this. And so are um, uh, you know, hip uh, surgeries and knee surgeries in elderly patients. So if you look at the duration of surgery in uh, these elderly patients, it is said that there is 6% increase for every 30 minutes of surgery. So it's always better to actually, uh, when patient come for uh, this major surgery or emergency surgery, and the quicker the surgery, the better the outcome. If you come to the um, anesthetic techniques, uh, selection and dosing of certain anesthetic and adjuncts uh, and possibly depth anesthesia, maybe, but there hasn't been any uh, strong evidence uh, that the anesthesia technically uh, matters a lot. Post-op risk factors are important. Um, so there are factors that may impact development, worsening or resolution of POCD. As we have said that increasing duration of anesthesia increase with increased incidence. Patients developing respiratory complications, patients having reoperation, patient developing post-operative infection and admission to the intensive care actually increase the risk of POCD. It has been seen that patients who are hosp hospitalized for uh, critical illness, the long-term cognitive and functional impairment can last for as, as long as five years or more. So admission to intensive care you know, remains a important factor. So looking at the causes, um, you know, we said that cardiac surgery, so embolization during cardiopulmonary bypass mm -hmm. has been, uh, postulated as one of the causes, uh, but then it is also seen with the patients off form bypass, all patients can also present with POCD. Uh, biochemical disturbances like hyponatremia uh, and you know, perioperative uh, situations like hypoxemia, hypertension, they do not actually, uh, you know, they do not, are not the cause for POCD, okay. So they are more, uh, can be, they can cause uh, delirium in the post-operative period, uh, which is short 
lasting, uh, unlike uh, the changes, cognitive changes seen uh, with POCD. Uh, so electrolyte imbalances, uh, reduct, you know, uh, hypoxia or hypertension are not risk factors. I have already uh, said this pre-existing cognitive impairment remains a, a risk factor. And uh, the educational level or educational performance is a risk factor. So somebody who has uh, uh, low educational performance is also a, a risk factor uh, for POCD. Uh, researchers have tried to look at if there is any markers of brain damage that may lead to POCD and they have looked at neuron specific analase, S100 beta protein, there is no correlate at all. So uh, there are no markers. Factors which might probably uh, contribute is the way, uh, you know, different patients handle the anesthetic drugs. So the elderly, uh, you know, patients uh, may not be able to metabolize the drugs that we give as effectively as the young ones. It also depends on how the uh, elderly respond uh, to the stress. So stress of surgery, stress of, uh, stress of anesthesia. So the adrenal response to surgery is important. And possibly, possibly there could be a risk gene for POC just like uh, that for Alzheimer's. But currently there's no good evidence to support uh, these theories. Pre-medication, uh, well, introduction of benzodiazepines to the elderly uh, should uh, not be done. Uh, it's a risk factor, but withdrawal of uh, benzodiazepines from patients who have been on them for a while is a risk factor for POCD. If the patients have been on anticholinesterase drugs like uh, donazepil and mimantin, they should not be stopped. Rather, they should be, it should be made sure that the patient gets these uh, memory enhancing drugs uh, so that they do not cause problems in the post-operative period. So do not stop them suddenly. Okay? This can precipitate cognitive failure uh, in the elderly. Pregabalin has been used as part of the enhanced recovery, and it has been shown that preoperative administration may decrease postoperative pain, but an opioid, but it is associated with increased risk of developing POCD. So pregabalin not a good idea in the elderly. Uh, Dexmetomidine uh, in postoperative it can reduce delirium. Uh, it's been used for treating that. Uh, but uh, using or administrating the uh, dexmedomidine intraoperatively uh, does not reduce the risk of patient developing post-operative cognitive dysfunction. So again, it has no role. General versus uh, regional anesthesia, many believe that uh, not exposing the patient to volta anesthetics or to peripheral uh, would be better, but there's, there is no, uh, you know, evidence that uh, general is better than, or you know, regional is better than general anesthesia. Coming if they, if you look at general anesthesia, is an inhalation better than intravenous anesthesia? And again, uh, there is no correlate. But rather, uh, one uh, study actually showed that the patients who had uh, total intravenous anesthesia with profile fared poorly compared to those uh, who are given sevoflurane. So again, uh, you know, use of TVA does not uh, uh, prevent uh, POCD. One of the important things uh, for prevention of POCD is day cases, okay? So if possible, elderly should uh, be operated as day case and they should be sent back to their normal, uh, you know, living and so admission to hospitals uh, supports uh, the concept of day case surgery uh, to prevent POCD. But then it is important that they support services like, uh, you know, competent relatives uh, who can look after them, uh, practice nurses who can visit these patients and social services are involved. Also, they would actually need a pre-op assessment. So they needed to be seen 
And that's okay because patient would only be visiting for that day and goes back home after the patient has been seen in the pre-op and all the investigations are done. So day case and POCD have strong, uh, you know, uh, correlation in a sense that uh, cases done as day case um, do better uh, than patients uh, who remain in the hospital uh, following the surgery. Coming to question number three. So discuss methods of applying non-invasive ventilation and uh, what are the uses and benefits. So um, there are 50% marks for that, uh, for methods, um, user benefit 30% marks, and uh, complications that may arise from ventilatory mode is 20% marks. So non-invasive ventilation basically refers to delivery of positive pressure ventilation through a non-invasive interface. So you're not intubating, you're not using an androtracheal tube or tracheostomy. So it's a non-invasive interface, uh, like nasal mask, nasal pillow, face mask, nasal plugs, the various methods. Okay. So the first thing which is very important is to have the right patient selection. You need to have patients who is conscious and cooperative. In this case, a patient with exuberation of COPD can be, ex be an exception because sometimes uh, these patients may present with CO2 narcosis. And obviously these are patients who do not require general endotracheal intubation uh, to protect airway or to remove secretions. The patient should not have any facial trauma because that would be required for a face mask fit. And patients should not have any recent gastroesophageal surgery or uh, gastrointestinal bleed because we know that uh, the, there can be uh, aerophagia and there can be swallowing of air uh, with non-invasive ventilation. Mm -hmm. And there should be no impaired swallowing. And the patient should be relatively hemodynamic uh, stable and uh, with a, a stable rhythm. So equipment we need is a nasal mask, nasal pillow, full face mask, helmets. There are various ways in which the interface can be used. We obviously need a machine and uh, there has to be a connection between the machine and the patient. And this is done through a circuit breathing system. And uh, it's good to actually have warm humidified gases uh, uh, so that there is no drying up of the gases or cold gases can be quite drying to the airway. So on the left side, you see a nasal pillow uh, with the straps and um, they uh, can be nasal masks. I'll show you how they are actually uh, different. So nasal pillow does not cover uh, the nose. So that is a nasal pillow. It's just like as um, your um, nasal specs uh, with a little support. Uh, so that's a nasal pillow. Uh, there is also a lip seal, which can orally, I don't think uh, anybody uses them, uh, but if uh, patient doesn't tolerate the nasal pillow or nasal, uh, mask. Uh, this is another method which can be used as so a lip, lip seal. I haven't seen that being used much. Uh, this is a full face mask, uh, non invasive ventilation. And on the right side, you have see a pillow. And uh, sorry, yeah, this is not a pillow, it's a helmet. And uh, during the COVID uh, time, a lot of people must have seen this being used. And, for non-invasive ventilation. So coming to the circuit, we can actually have a single limb circuit uh, where the expiration is uh, passive, but you can also have single limb circuit with, uh, with an active exhalation valve. Uh, this is uh, controlled by a, a pressurized line, which we can actually see. Or you can have a circuit which is sim simple, as like our uh, normal breathing system with a uh, dual uh, limb. Okay, so we have inspiratory and expiratory uh, limbs connected to face, so that's a circuit. We can use um, the uh, HME uh, filters can be used. 
so they can provide some amount of uh, humidity. Uh, so uh, this is simple to use, but you need to then change them every 12 to 24 hours, depending on the type of HME you used. But if you're using uh, machines uh, like this uh, Vision uh, from Respironics, uh, this can actually be attached uh, to a humidifier as is used with uh, usual ventilators. So uh, that's a better humidification. Uh, the uh, modes of setting can, the patients can be on CPAP. Uh, CPAP is good for oxygenation, but uh, if you want to get rid of carbon dioxide, then you might have to use BiPAP, uh, in which you have an EPAP setting and IPAP setting. So that's um, the uh, like a BiPAP. So two levels. So you have a continuous positive airway pressure, and then intermittently the pressure is actually increased. Uh, so there is a P1 and P2, and there are two times a T. T1 and T2. And uh, so when the pressure goes up, there is kind of inspiration. And uh, during CPAP, there is, uh, or EPAP, there is expiration. So, and that is, uh, so rate is normally taken as the 60 divided by the two T1 by T2. And um, if the compliance is known, which ventilator can calculate, uh, then your volume delivered will be compliance into the pressure. Uh, pressure would be uh, P1 minus P2. Uh, P2 is during the inspiratory phase and uh, P2 during the expiratory phase. So there, pressure support ventilation is another mode. So um, when your initi initiation is done, uh, basically you need to make sure uh, that patient is uh, in a proper location. Uh, you have the monitoring. Um, so you need uh, oximetry, uh, monitoring the vitals, it's always better to actually have patients sitting on the bed or chair with a 30 degrees uh, uh, head up position. And you need to select a proper fit, whether it's a nasal mask or it is a uh, you know, normal mask. You need to actually have proper, proper uh, you know, selection and fit. And then uh, you will actually uh, require a ventilator. Uh, so there are standalone uh, ventilator for non-invasive ventilation. So once you've done that, you apply the headgear and uh, you make sure that there's no excessive uh, you know, pressure along these straps. So you should be able to put one or two fingers under the straps. And once this is done, then you connect the interface to the ventilator tubing and uh, turn on the ventilator. Again, depends on uh, what you really want to do. If you uh, want both oxygenation and to get rid of the CO2, uh, then you would want to use a BiPAP or bi-level positive and expiratory pressure BiPAP. So you start with a low pressure and spontaneously triggered mode uh, with backup rate. And inspiratory pressure is actually set uh, or IPAP is set at eight to 12 centimeters of water. And EPAP is set around three to five centimeters of water. Then you gradually increase the IPAP to 10 to 20 centimeters of water as uh, is tolerated uh, by the patient. And um, the volumes are well tolerated, it alleviates the uh, dyspnea, it reduces the respiratory rate, increases the tidal volume, if you can monitor that. And there is a good patient to ventilatory synchrony. As far as oxygen supplementation is concerned, don't try to or be over jealous. Uh, having a saturation above 90% is okay. And this will improve with time anyway, once the uh, condition of the patient uh, gets better. Uh, but if you are looking at uh, just uh, maintaining oxygenation, uh, you're trying to actually deliver just the CPAP, uh, you want to recruit uh, some of the alveoli or using it to get rid of the extra alveolar uh, fluid, uh, and say in patients uh, with pulmonary edema. In that case, uh, uh, CPAP level is set around five to eight centimeters of water, but you can actually increase it to almost up to 20 centimeters of water, depending on how the patient tolerates it. So you have to also not only look at oxygenation, but you also need to look at respiratory mechanics. You also need to look at the hemodynamics as well. So patients should also be able to tolerate uh, this high pressure because 
you are increasing the intrathoracic pressure, you will reduce the venous return. And that can lead to drop in uh, the, uh, you know, blood pressure. And again, here, um, the aim for oxygen saturation should be about 90%. In some situation, you can use pressure support ventilation. Again, this is uh, be good not only for supporting the ventilation, uh, but also getting rid of the CO2. Uh, here's the inspirative pressure is set at around 8 to 12 centimeters of water, and the positive and expirative pressure at around 35 centimeters of water. And then you can increase, gradually increase the inspirative pressure to up to 20 centimeters of water. You don't actually have to go to 20 centimeters. Uh, once you get adequate uh, tidal volumes and uh, there's improvement on dyspnea and the respiratory rate come down, uh, you can be around 15, 20, whatever is uh, suitable for that particular group of patients. The follow-up is equally important. Uh, you need to check for air leaks. You might have to readjust the straps because they could be digging into the patient's face. Make sure that the gases patient has been delivered or is humidified. In some cases, you might consider mild sedation, um, even like simple, like chlorazepam 0.5 milligrams uh, might be helpful uh, for patient. And most importantly, patients actually require reassurance. They require encouragement. And um, they, it is a lot more um, labor intensive because you require frequent checks and uh, you also need to keep adjusting uh, the ventilator settings, depending on uh, your parameters. Uh, blood gases, the first blood gases need to be monitored within an hour or two, and then you can monitor them as per the patients, uh, how they are responding to your treatment. So uses uh, for uh, the non-invasive ventilation, uh, chronic respiratory failure, and uh, patients with neuromuscular disease or patients with chronic lung disease uh, remains uh, the main indication. Uh, CPAP has been used for obstructive sleep apnea, so not damp CPAP. It has also been used for sleep disorder breathing, which is can be part of obstructive sleep apnea, and also as part of chronic heart failure treatment. Acute respiratory failure in patient uh, with exhibition of COPD is another more established indication for non-invasive ventilation. It has been seen that uh, non-invasive ventilation reduces the need for intubation, uh, reduces overall complications uh, and hospital length of stay and hospital mortality. So it's a good mode. Now uh, CPAP has been used in acute pulmonary edema to get rid of the uh, extra alveolar water and uh, this has seemed to reduce the need for intubation, uh, but there is no clear mortality benefit. And it has been seen that uh, BiPAP should be avoided in acute uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And uh, in a study, it was seen that uh, it, there was excessive number of uh, uh, myocardial infarction in uh, patients who were uh, provided BiPAP. Uh, so, CPAP is probably okay, uh, but don't get over jealous and uh, try to ventilate the patient using BiPAP in patients uh, with uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Complications, obviously they can be serious air leaks. Uh, if the face mask is not uh, uh, you know, fitting properly. And um, also, um, the effectiveness of the NIV may be compromised because of the, of the leaks. And if the face mask is tightly fitted, then there can be breakdown of skin. And there can be uh, aerophagia leading to gastric distension. Uh, we have actually seen uh, this huge uh, stomach filled with air in patients which got deflated just by putting a uh, uh, NG tube, patients will complain of severe abdominal pain. Uh, so be wary of that. And, uh, and there is obviously leaks around uh, the mask and this can cause drying of the eyes. Uh, so you can use artificial tears for patients, uh, but I need to be actually sure that there's not uh, much leaks around the eye. Uh, 
Skin breakdown of the nerves, uh, bridge of nerves is very common in the patient. And sometimes you might actually have to apply special dressings for that. So those are the complications that are question three. Coming to question number four, and uh, this is about uh, uh, chronic pain, uh, about post herpetic neuralgia. So what is uh, post herpetic neuralgia? What are the clinical features, 20% each? How will you manage a patient with post herpetic neuralgia? It's 60%. So uh, post herpetic neuralgia remains a common cause of neuropathic pain. And uh, it is one of the common and feared complications of uh, herpes zoster infection. So post herpetic neuralgia is defined as pain which persists for more than three months after an acute period or four months after the appearance of the rash. So incidence of the acute uh, herpes zoster infection increases uh, uh, because of impairment of immune system. Um, immune system can be impaired because of age of the disease process or patients who have been on medications which impair like radiotherapy or chemotherapy, which can impair immunity. So invariably, it is actually seen uh, the major risk factor for herpetic post herpetic neuralgia are old age, uh, patients um, who have greater acute pain with herpes zoster infection, or patients who have greater rash severity. So these group of patients are high risk for developing uh, PNI, PHN after a herpes zoster infection. So basically this herpes zoster um, virus or varicella zoster virus uh, remains uh, uh, in a dormant and uh, in acute herpes zoster, there is reactivation in patients who have reduced immunity or during stressful time. And this virus can persist for years in the dorsal root ganglia uh, of the cranial as well as uh, spinal nerves. That's why you see trigeminal division and um, so when the immunity of the patient goes down because of age or there's a immunocompromise and the virus get transported uh, along the peripheral nerve and it produces neuritis and that's why you actually see it in a only a and a single dermatome you can see in multiple dermatomes as well uh, but it actually follows the dermatome uh, which is supplied by a particular nerve so here uh, is a herpes zoster infection. Okay. So at the cellular level, what exactly is happening? Why is this causing so much of a problem? So the infection with acute herpes zoster uh, causes hemorrhagic inflammation uh, within the peripheral nerves, uh, dorsal root, and the dorsal root ganglia. It can sometimes spread uh, into the spinal cord or into the leptomeninges. But most of the time it actually goes along the peripheral nerve causing a typical lesion. And it has also been seen uh, at autopsies, they've been seen uh, that there is fibrosis uh, in the dorsal root ganglia and the nerve roots and the peripheral, roots, uh, peripheral nerves uh, even after the resolution of acute process. And that is uh, what leads to the uh, post neuralgia. So they are seeing the virus actually being transmitted along the peripheral nerve um, to the skin where it causes these blisters like uh, lesions. Okay. So the dorsal horn atrophy uh, is also seen um, as well as you see cellular, axonal and uh, myelinosis fibrosis uh, in the sensory ganglia uh, in patients with persistent pain. Uh, in patients um, with or without pain, there can be marked axonal and uh, myelin loss in the nerves or, or, uh, or the sensory roots. So uh, it's common, the axonal uh, myelin loss is common uh, in both patients with or without pain. So coming to the clinical features, obviously there has to be a history of uh, uh, herpes zoster or shingles as it's called. Um, 
So uh, thoracic is the most common one, but uh, it can also present in cervical and uh, trigeminal uh, nerve distribution. Uh, the pain that is associated uh, with this condition is usually burning, uh, sharp or stabbing, and it can be constant or intermittent. And 90% uh, of the patient, 90% or more of the patient actually have allodynia. Uh, that means even the normally non-painful stimuli, uh, such as even wearing a shirt uh, can trigger the pain. And uh, itching is very, very common. So patient trying to scratch the lesions, uh, itching is a prominent feature of uh, post hepatic neuralgia. So coming to the management of the uh, treatment, um, so we start off with non-opiate drug therapy. Um, the first line uh, of treatment is uh, gabapentin or pregabalin. And uh, uh, this is used in patients who have moderate to severe uh, post hepatic neuralgia. Uh, you need to avoid or reduce the dose in patients uh, with uh, uh, renal insufficiency. Uh, then comes the tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, this is also used uh, for moderate to severe pain. And uh, this is actually then uh, used if the patients are intolerant to gabapentin or pregabalin, then tricyclic antidepressants are used. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants should be avoided in patients who have heart disease, uh, patients who have a history of epilepsy or glaucoma, because they have the anticholinergic effect. Okay. And for the same reason, and they're also avoiding in elderly patients and because they can cause cognitive impairment or uh, dementia. So uh, tricyclic antidepressant, not a good drug in these patients. Opiates are considered to be second or third line of treatment. And uh, uh, this has been more recent uh, with the uh, uh, opiate pandemic. Uh, so the risk of addiction risks there, so they have become second and third line. and um, they can be used uh, in a simultaneously with the uh, tricyclic antidepressants or uh, you know pre or gabapentin. And um, the reason being that uh, pre or gabapentin, it can take weeks before you can actually see the effect. Uh, whereas the opioid will likely provide you immediate pain relief. And uh, that's why they are initiated. Uh, they should be started in a low dose. And um, as soon as you start seeing the effects of the uh, gabapentinoids or tricyclic antidepressant, then you need to taper them off and take the patient off the opioids. Okay. The other anticonvulsants, um, now gabapentin and pregabalin or gabapentinoids are also considered as anticonvulsant. Uh, the other drugs uh, which were very commonly used uh, before uh, were well, carmazepine, uh, oxycarmazepine, uh, lamotrigine, and valproic acid. Now these are anticonvulsants and they have been used for other neuropathic pain, especially like trigeminal neuralgia and diabetic neuropathy. Uh, so they have been tried uh, for uh, PAHN as well. Uh, supporting evidence is of very low quality and uh, it's basically uh, anecdotal experiences uh, which have been used. Okay. So these can be tried uh, in patients who uh, fail to tolerate the first line uh, medications, that is gabapentinoids, uh, or where you want to avoid opiates or injections. Intravenous uh, lignocaine, uh, it does actually give uh, some pain relief, but unfortunately the uh, pain relief is not sustained and uh, not beyond four weeks. So uh, intravenous lignocaine does not actually help much. NMD receptor antagonists like uh, ketamine or dextromethamorphone uh, have been used. Uh, again, intravenous ketamine induces modest pain relief, but the dose used uh, is larger, which causes sedation, dysphoria, and dissociative episodes. So it's not a good drug on its own. And there has been a randomized double bonded cross over trial um, compared over six weeks of treatment with uh, uh, dex dextro uh, metho methotrophin, uh, which is another uh, NMD receptor antagonist, and there was no significant relief uh, demonstrated. So, 
And the NMD receptors probably uh, not the best treatment for uh, you know, uh, the post-hepatic neuralgia. Now, topically, uh, uh, capsaicin has been used um, even though there is uh, limited data. Uh, but uh, the, I think that's because I think the concentration used uh, varies quite a lot. Uh, so people have used very low concentration of copsicin, uh, 0 0.025% to 0.75%, which is actually a very low concentration. You need to apply it around four times a day. And the reason why people tend to use low concentration because it causes burning, uh, stinging, erythema. And uh, so almost one third of patients are intolerable uh, to this uh, treatment. But with high concentration where they use 8%, uh, a 60 minutes application uh, seems to actually work well. Then comes lignocaine, 5% uh, topical. And um, so even though there are small relatively low, uh, clots, uh, you know, low quality placebo control trials, uh, but it has been seen to be more effective uh, than IV infusion. So locally applying 5% uh, lidocaine uh, is better. Uh, than IV uh, preparation. Then uh, uh, botulinum toxin, uh, this is not very well studied, and, uh, but whatever evidence is available, it shows it is effective. And uh, there have been uh, double blinded RCTs. Uh, so 30 adults with uh, post neuralgia uh, with persistent pain for at least three months uh, were uh, you know, given this trial. And compared with placebo injection, uh, botulinum toxin type A injection were beneficial for pain. Uh, the, it was reduced at two weeks. And uh, the number of responders, that is the patient who achieved more than 50% uh, reduction in pain score was significantly greater uh, for the active group. And the uh, pain, uh, the benefit, uh, that is the pain relief lasted for more than 16 weeks and the treatment was well tolerated. So this is another uh, you know, treatment modality which has not been used. People have tried intrathecal glucocorticoids and um, you know that uh, the post hepatic neurology can affect trigeminal nerve. And uh, because uh, you, know, you can't apply uh, a lot of things uh, in the division of trigeminal nerve. So intrathecal uh, glucocorticoid was thought to be a, a good option, uh, but the evidence of uh, pain relief was not consistent uh, with intrathecal glucocorticoids, so it can't be uh, uh, you know, recommended. Uh, then comes the cryotherapy where you freeze the peripheral nerve. And um, so again, one small unblinded study uh, for facial pain, and they was unable to show any significant benefit. Uh, unfortunately, in this, the authors did not uh, mention the inclusion criteria, whether the patient was receiving uh, other treatment modalities and uh, how the response was assessed. But another trial uh, showed considerable relief. So this was only in 14 patients, and 11 out of the 14 patients uh, did show uh, good uh, pain relief uh, when they were assessed at uh, two weeks uh, using a questionnaire. But then there is a difference. In the first trial, they were using, trying to use it uh, for the uh, pain from, uh, so facial pain, that would have been trigeminal neuro, uh, you know, in the division of the trigeminal nerve. And here they were using intercostal nerves. And we know that uh, the uh, uh, cryotherapy has been used as uh, treatment or modality uh, for uh, thoracic pain. So it's a known, method. More invasive treatments, surgical in, uh, uh, treatments like uh, electrical stimulation of thalamus, uh, anterolateral chorotomy, uh, electrocoagulation of uh, dorsal roots. Uh, these carry substantial risk and can cause permanent neurological damage and there has been no consistent relief. Then there have been like uh, spinal cord stimulation and peripheral nerve stimulation. This again remain uh, experimental. And uh, in case reports and case series, uh, they've been seen to be effective in about 50% of patients. So 50% of patients respond, 50% don't uh, respond. 
The other methods uh, like using TENS or using uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation acupuncture, they haven't proven to be of uh, much benefit. There is also a experimental drug called EMA401, uh, which is selective angiotensin II type two receptor antagonist. And uh, this has been seen to be more effective than placebo in a preliminary randomized control trials. So we still wait to see the results of this and probably this will be given a name as well because it still remains a experimental agent. So if you look at uh, the, you know, this is actually a simple, uh, you know, chart. Uh, and probably good for exam purposes. So we can actually use that uh, the prevention, which I didn't talk about. And this is all FDA approved. And they says that varicella vaccination against chickenpox in all children less than 13 years or older, or children who have never been exposed to chickenpox uh, should be vaccinated. And then again, individuals who are more than 50 years uh, uh, should be vaccinated uh, for prevention of post neuralgia. Uh, looking at the first line treatment, and uh, so this is management of uh, PNH. So they are FDA approved drugs are gabapentinoids and there can be immediate release, gastroprotective, pregabalin, and uh, the lidocaine patch. These are FDA approved. Uh, tricycling antidepressants are not FDA approved, uh, but they're still used. Then there are combination therapy where uh, gabapentinoids along with uh, tricyclic antidepressants, gabapentinoids is opioids like morphine, and then uh, pregabalin and uh, lidocaine patch. So they, these are combination therapy. Now, second and third line treatment, uh, uh, what is FDA approved is uh, capsaicin, 8% uh, patch. And uh, non-FDA approved, uh, yes, opioids, uh, oxycodone, morphine, methadone, tramadol. Uh, these are non-opioid, uh, non-FDA approved uh, management of PNH, PN, and uh, and so is the low dose of, of capsaicin creams. Uh, these are not uh, FDA approved. FDA is only approved eight percent patch, uh, capsaicin patch. Yeah, so sixty minutes left on for sixty minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now coming to uh, the uh, next question. Uh, this is again a, a difficult one. So we'd be talking about coagulation, uh, coagulation cascade. Uh, describe the coagulation cascade and how may coagulation be assessed in the perioperative period. And uh, so uh, this I would actually say almost 50-50% or 60-50%. Uh, so you need to actually know and uh, the coagulation cascade uh, very well. So normal uh, coagulation starts with uh, primary hemostasis. So when uh, there is injury to a uh, you know vascular injury, uh, there is aggregation of platelets, and that is a very important uh, initiation of coagulation. And then you have coagulation factors where we have the uh, intrinsic ones. These are the uh, uh, factors which are circulating in the intervascular compartment. And the intrinsic pathway, uh, which these are factors which are found in the tissue, and these act to stabilize the clot. So traditionally, this is the way uh, we have, we have the extrinsic pathway where there's tissue damage, uh, which lead to exposure of tissue factors. And uh, this will combine with the uh, factor seven. And uh, then there is a common pathway uh, same thing uh, in the intrinsic pathway, surface contact uh, leads to activation of factor 12 to 12A. Uh, 12A will activate 11, 11 will activate 9, and 9 uh, along with the factor 8 will activate 10. Okay, so this is the, this is the uh, usual, uh, you know, method, but uh, there has been a lot more uh, further uh, uh, you know, description of coagulation cascade. And uh, so they say there is initiation, there's amplification, and there propagation and stabilization. So what exactly happened uh, in, the, uh, in the initiation phase, uh, when there is tissue damage, there is expression of tissue factor, uh, then tissue factors combined with factor 7a. Uh, the factor 7a uh, will 
activate factor 5A. It will also activate factor 10A. Uh, factor 10A, uh, so this combination of uh, tissue factor or 7A, uh, this is called extrinsic uh, 10 A's, and uh, because these are activating the factor 10, those are TNAs. And uh, this factor 10A uh, then converts prothrombin to thrombin. And uh, this, the, um, the extrinsic 10 A's, that is the, uh, the tissue factor and factor 7A uh, also activates factor 9 to 9A. And uh, there is also activation of factor 8, which is attached to one Willebrand really factor. And this factor 8A then attaches to factor 9A. And this is called a factor intrinsic uh, tenase. So this is part of the amplification. Uh, thrombin again is involved in conversion of factor 8 to 8A. It is also involved in conversion of 5 to 5A. Uh, 5A then combines uh, with factor 10A and forms something called prothrombinase complex, which converts prothrombin to thrombin in greater amount. And thrombin then activates the fibrinogen to fibrin, and uh, thrombin converts uh, 12A to 12, 12 to 12A, and the combination of 12A and the fibrin uh, then uh, causes uh, the formation of insoluble fibrin, and that is the uh, stabilization phase. So this, this is, I think, the better way of explaining the coagulation cascade. So there is initiation, there is amplification, there is propagation, and there is stabilization. And uh, there is formation of extrinsic tenase, uh, there is uh, formation of intrinsic uh, tenase, uh, formation of prothrombinase complex, and then propagation uh, of the uh, coagulation factors. Um, I'll, I'll pose this uh, for you guys on the group. This is describing at the endothelial uh, level. So uh, this is difficult to actually uh, you know, do for the exam, but uh, people who are artistic can actually use this uh, way as well. I think uh, the way I have described uh, previously is better. Uh, so here you can actually see on the left-hand corner and uh, there is vessel wall injury or activation of the endothelial cell. Uh, this exposes uh, the tissue factor to the blood and uh, this causes binding of the factor uh, seven and uh, this is uh, activation of factor seven A. And this uh, tissue factor and seven A complex, this is called extrinsic TNS, as I said. Uh, this activates small amount of factor nine and factor 10, uh, which you can actually see in the middle of the screen. So there it is. And uh, this then factor nine, um, and uh, then will activate uh, factor 10 associated with factor five, and uh, they form the prothrombinase complex. At the same time, the factor nine, uh, activated factor nine, it binds to factor uh, eight, uh, along with the, uh, uh, you know, on the negatively charged uh, surface of platelets. Um, the phospholipids are involved as well in here. So then there is also uh, cleavage of the factor uh, two, that is the prothrombin to thrombin, and then activation of thrombin, uh, you know, of course, which then will cause uh, conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, and also that. So that I explained that. So here, uh, what is doing, it's also uh, looking at the involvement of the platelets. Platelet activation is an important factor uh, in the uh, formation uh, of the plug as well as for activation of the coagulation. So uh, the, uh, you know, platelets has got a pleiotropic function and this is um, important. Uh, so platelet activation, fibrin formation, feedback inhibition. And uh, so, uh, signaling through the protease uh, activated receptors or PARs. Uh, this is done by thrombin. Mm -hmm. So how do we assess uh, coagulation? Uh, for first thing, as usual, uh, it's important to look at the clinical history. 
Uh, we need to see if the, there is a history uh, of prolonged bleeding uh, after things like ex, you know dental extraction or you know easy or spondylitis bruising. Uh, is there a family history of uh, the same? If the patient has not been uh, you know exposed to these. You know, he's not uh, had dental extraction. Easy spontaneous bruising may be common. So uh, family history is equally important. Uh, bleeding time was uh, done in the olden times uh, where you made a standardized stab of three millimeters. And then you kept uh, looking at when this bleeding stops on a uh, paper. So that is not useful now because normal BT does not exclude uh, potential problems and an abnormal one does not predict them either. So bleeding time is not much of use now. Nobody does them. A whole world clotting uh, looks at intrinsic pathway and uh, uh, this can be done clinically. The surgeons will tell you that, oh, there is abnormal using, uh, or you can actually take a sample uh, of blood in a plain glass tube and you look for how long the clot takes to form. So that is a whole blood, you know, whole blood clotting system. Looking, looking at the intensity. Uh, platelet numbers, you need to actually send the blood sample to the lab. And obviously the count is important. The numbers are important. Uh, more important in the function. So even though patient might actually have low uh, counts, if the quality of platelets is good, and that's fine. Uh, but then uh, platelet function analyzes are not easily available. Uh, there are bedside uh, platelet function analysis that uh, PFAs are available, uh, but uh, not to us. Then uh, again, the labs can do prothrombin time and that is, looks at the uh, extinct, as, uh, extrinsic coagulation pathway and normal PT is 10 to 14 seconds. And more commonly it is compared with the international, so it's called international INR and uh, that is uh, more commonly used. Activated uh, partial thromboplastin time or APTT as is the intrinsic pathway. Uh, the normal duration and the uh, time is 30 to 40 seconds is normal values. Uh, ACT can be done as bedside and this is commonly used in the vascular theaters or when patients have uh, go on cardiopulmonary bypass where we're giving uh, large doses of heparin. Uh, it's also important uh, when you want to reverse the heparin, uh, sorry, the heparin with protamine. So activated clotting time is important for that. Uh, fibrogen levels are important and they are depleted uh, uh, during like uh, massive uh, transfusion. And uh, you can also make them out uh, when you use thromboelastogram. So thromboelastogram is again a bedside test uh, which gives us a lot of uh, information about clotting. So thromboelastogram uses four key values. It looks at the R value, that is the clotting time. It measures times to, it takes for the first sign of clot to appear. Like I said, you can do it in a test tube, <laughs> in a glass tube, but this is a more scientific method. Then you can look at uh, K value. Uh, this is a time period from the end of R. Uh, until the clot reaches a certain strength, uh, generally expressed as, as an amplitude of 20 millimeters. So at a point uh, where the, uh, it reaches 20 millimeters, at that time, that is look at the uh, uh, clot kinetics. Then we look at the alpha angle. Alpha angle is the angle between the line in the middle of the thrombolastogram tracing and the line tangent to the developing body of the graph. And these represent the quantities of fibrin cross-linking. So this is also important. And last thing which you look at is the strength of the clot that is based on the MA values for the uh, maximum amplitude uh, of the graph. So that is gives us the uh, strength of the clot. So it gives a lot of value from a, from a single sample of blood. Uh, you can get a lot of information. And uh, this is a, a good uh, sort of, uh, I think a uh, line diagram, uh, which you may, might find useful. So you look at the platelet counts and uh, if they're normal, uh, then you look at PT and APTT. Now, if uh, both are normal, then you can actually analyze mm -hmm. the platelet function 
Uh, so there are a bedside one like PFA 100, or we can look at platelet morphology, or we can look at platelet uh, aggregation test. And if they are abnormal, then they can uh, think of von Willebrand disease or Bernard Suler syndrome or Glanzmann thrombosthenia. Okay, so in this case, PT and APT are you know, normal. But if you see that the PT is normal, but there is increase in APTT level, and uh, then you are actually looking at the intrinsic pathway. So you're looking at the factor 11, 12, uh, 13, and 9, and you need can do a mixing studies. And if the factor 8 is reduced, like you think of hemophilia A, and if uh, factor 9 is reduced, then it's hemophilia B. If the PT on its own is increased, uh, but APT is normal, uh, then uh, this is looking at the extrinsic pathway, factor seven, uh, deficiency, so vitamin K deficiency in liver disease or patient of warfarin. Now, if both are PT and APTT are an abnormal, then you can look at fibrinogen level. If the fibrinogen level is low, then start thinking of uh, DIC, uh, but if fibrinogen levels are normal, and uh, then you can look at uh, vitamin K deficiency or deficiency of factor two, seven, nine, and 10, or you can look at it might be because of liver disease uh, where you will actually see reduction in factor five levels. And uh, there is increase in factor eight in hepatic necrosis. Uh, there can be inherent uh, coagulation disorders uh, uh, with where you can actually uh, low levels of factor five, 10 or two. And uh, it can again be because of excessive anticoagulation, use of uh, excessive anticoagulation can also lead to uh, the fibrinogen. Coming to the last uh, question of the day, and uh, this is on uh, spinal needles. And so what are the main consideration keeping in mind in designing of a spinal needle? And uh, what practical problems are expected with these designs? And what are the problems of continuous spinal catheters? So we got 50% mass about designing of the needle, 30% uh, mass for the practical problems expected with the design and 20% uh, about question on the catheters, spinal catheters. So coming to designing a spinal needle. So the first thing as anesthetists, we want to actually see a uh, as spine needle as possible uh, because it is thought that larger needle cause uh, postdural puncture headache. So there are extremely fine needles are there, there's 29G needles. Uh, but then they're prone to bending on insertion. And because they, say they are so thin that the backflow can be extremely difficult to. And then there are larger needles like 22G needles, but then they are unacceptable. So incidence of headache uh, is high, especially in obstetric population. So we have look at a compromise. So compromise is using 24 or 25G uh, needles and uh, and in our setup, we tend to use uh, 24 to 25 G in most patients. And to risk uh, to reduce the risk of needle bending, we actually use introduce a needle uh, even with 24 to 25 G needles. But there are people who tend to actually not use introducer uh, with this, but we tend to use introducer. Next come the bevel or the tip. Traditionally, it was uh, a sharp bevel, uh, just like your hypodermic needle. So that is a quinkus needle. Uh, but the recent needles, the end uh, point uh, is either pencil point or it's bullet point. And that is because of the reasoning that these kind of uh, tips uh, will cause separating of the uh, dural fibers uh, rather than uh, causing them to uh, cut through the fibers. Okay. Now, because the tip is uh, pencil point or bullet point, and uh, the hole has to be on the side. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the your quacking needles and the pencil point and the bullet point needles. Okay, you can actually see the holes on the side in the pencil point and the bullet point needle. Then what about the needles? Okay, so normal needles 
are 10 centimeters long, that is including the hub. Uh, shorter needles are available for children, five centimeter needle. And there are long needles, 15 centimeter needles available for uh, the obese patients. And there are also uh, long needles when they are part of the uh, CSC kit. So the spinal needle which passes through the epidural needle and they are longer, they're 15 centimeter. All needles come with a stillet and this prevent coring of superficial tissue uh, because it has been seen that if there is coring of skin and it's deposited in the CSF, this can cause formation of a cyst, epidermal cyst formation can happen. The practical, uh, the practical problems with the side portion are that uh, this becomes a point of weakness. Okay, so there can be bending and, and breaking. And the other thing is that because the uh, port is on the side, so it can, you can pierce the dura, so you feel the pop, uh, you go partially in and uh, you can aspirate the CSF, but when you inject the local anesthetic, it get partly deposited in the subacnoid space and partly in the epidural subdural space. So that it can lead to failures. Okay. And so it is uh, then said that, oh, you should uh, try to introduce, uh, even once you feel a pop, you go in a little bit more. And uh, if you do that, then there is a risk of traumatic contact with nerve root uh, increases. Okay, when you actually try to do that. So this is what actually happens. So uh, you got the side, uh, you know, port or the hole. And when you aspirate, the CSF comes out easily. But when you inject, then the part of it may be deposited in the CSF, uh, but part actually get deposited in the epidural or the subdural space. So that's can lead to partial or no block at all. So those were the problems uh, with the newer uh, spinal needles. So dural puncture headache obviously remains a, a risk. And uh, to reduce this risk, we tend to use smaller needles. Uh, smaller needles, uh, there's risk of bending, risk of breaking. Coming to spinal catheters, the spinal catheters are usually 28 to 32 G size. And uh, these are passed through a slightly larger needle. So you would need to use 22 spinal needle to thread these catheters. There has been uh, reports of Kodaikna syndromes with continuous uh, spinal anesthesia. And uh, this could be because of the endeavoring micro spinal catheters irritating them. Or it has been said that it could be probably be because of the very high concentration of local anesthetics, uh, which is considered the most likely cause of that. So with this, uh, we finish uh, today's uh, lecture, six lectures. The next Tuesday, we have the um, ICU seminar. Uh, so we won't be doing this class. And uh, so we'll see the week after, uh, we'll see that. And we'll keep you informed. And uh, thank you 